Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this uh, lunchtime briefing um, in preparation for the National Academy Committee's field trip tomorrow. Oh, uh, the speaker is going to be uh, John Muir, who is the project chief with the Water Resources Division of the U.S. Geological Survey in Sacramento where he oversees a staff of about 30, and among many other things, operates and maintains uh, over 40 flow and water quality monitoring stations, 120 juvenile salmon acoustic telemetry tracking receivers throughout the Sam Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. John has spent more than 40 years studying transport processes in San Francisco Bay and the Delta. Through analysis of field data, numerical models, while exiting large management project interdisciplinary interagency process-based investigations aimed at understanding the intersection between physical, biogeochemical, biological, and ecological processes. And I think it's fair to say that few people that have worked on Bay Delta issues have not interacted and collaborated with John over the years. So John, we know we have a lot on your plate, so thanks for being with us. Yeah, I've had a lot of really good mentors. And in fact, one of the best ways to learn about someone else's discipline is to work with them. It's very exciting to uh, work with people and have the data rolling off and uh, learning from uh, everybody learning from each other. So this is going to be a, an interesting talk. Um, I decided to really go in a little bit deeper on the hydrodynamics and uh, tides than I normally do with the idea of cleaning up <laughs> uh, any misunderstandings or things that I went through too quickly. Uh, when I got on the tour. So a lot of the slides I have here, I'll be showing on the tour. But the, the idea here is to really try and show the interaction, inter, inter, intersections between things. And so uh, each one of the things I talk about is going to be necessarily for free. All right. It's really laggy. Okay, I'm just going to have to get used to it. Okay, so uh, this is obviously a big program. We've got a whole bunch of... Uh, Hydrotechs and people working in the Delta. I really need to acknowledge my my partner, Kathy Rule. She pretty much runs the show. Uh, I I do I help with the analysis and guiding people who are doing the analysis. Um, our field team is amazing. Um, we've been doing this a really long time. They do a lot of cutting edge equipment development, some of which I'll be talking about tomorrow. And then the more the more recent stuff that I've done uh, lately uh, is been funded by the state board. They were interested in looking at X two. And uh, we uh, and, and the Bureau of Reclamation funds all the <laughs> water quality monitor, not all of it, probably about 80% of the water quality monitoring. Um, and I know also all of the acoustic telemetry stuff. So uh, we've got a lot of the people that are, are funding our work in the system and doing the monitoring. And so you can do that. So I'm going to start briefly with uh, the San Francisco Estuary as a food limited system. I'm going to focus on that primarily in the, uh, in the Sassoon Bay uh, area, talking about X2. Um, I'm going to try and make the connection between places that produce food and those that accumulate it. A lot of you may not know that there are places that accumulate uh, detritus uh, and, and uh, can support a detrital food web. And so, uh, and then there's also uh, places in Sassoon Bay where things get stratified and phytoplankton uh, blooms happen. So I'm going to focus a little bit on that, trying to remind people that this is a system, it's a physical system and it is an ecosystem. Um, and then, uh, this is going to be an interesting part of my talk. Um, we're kind of kind of changed. In fact, we're going to radically change the conceptual model of low frequency variations in the delta. And that's a big deal because that's the time scales at which you can do things with other water project operations and other things. And so uh, this is something that uh, we've been working on for just about the last six months. We're very certain that what we're saying is correct. So this will be an interesting talk because because we're exposing some other low frequency variations that occur in the in the hydrodynamics in the system um, we can start to talk about uh, synchronizing operations with these these motions and then I'll talk about transport uh, why it's important and how it's achieved um, and we'll, we'll go from there and so hopefully I'll get to the transport part because there, in all of these things the idea is to talk about this basic stuff and then um, show some of these things, how they might be implemented on the ground. So, Jim, I'm going to start with this. 
uh, there was a bunch of us, Jeffrey Mount and Jay got a bunch of us together to talk about um, uh, the uh, voluntary agreements. But the things that we said don't just apply to the voluntary agreements. They're very general. Um, and the, the advice they gave was there are three fundamental like, ecological problems. Uh, we have a low productivity, productivity system um, and there's non-native plants. I'm gonna focus on the, and, and water quality is declining. I'm gonna focus on this. And then um, this blog basically gave uh, three tools that we could use uh, to uh, address these problems. And managing freshwater flows is all about river flows, I assume, if I remember right, and uh, exports and so forth. But the two things on there that we talked about managing tides and landscapes, we really didn't talk about. <laughs> and I'm going to put some meat on the bones today on those ideas. Just, uh, I, I know you guys, I think you guys are focused mostly on managing freshwater flows. Uh, but if we can start talking about managing the tides and landscapes, uh, it's going to give us some additional tools, uh, I think, to improve the ecosystem. So the other point is all of these things need to be applied in concert. And so the folks that are managing the freshwater flows know about those that are uh, knows, need to know about the tides. And then, of course, if we're, we're building around landscapes, mark restoration, whatever, uh, everybody kind of needs to know what's going on. And that's going to be a challenge in the system. So this is also a PGIC thing where Jim Corn uh, came out and asked why is the Delta starving. This is a plot from his uh, one of his papers, 1994, and this is still true today. You guys probably all know this, but I wanted to start with this to let you know that's one of the things that uh, some of the work I'm doing, certainly in the X2 low salinity zone region, is focused on. So um, here's the first sort of physical thing that I want to talk about, and this is something that happens in brackish water systems. Uh, throughout the world, actually, in which you have salty water on one side. Let me see if I can do this for the people online. You guys see my mouse? No. No, we put it one. That's not good. Let's go back. So if you focus on the, the uh, uh, left-hand side of that plot, you'll see salinity is high uh, on the left-hand side. And the right side is fresh. And where the two meet, um, you have this secondary, this, this gravitational circulation occur. Um, and when that occurs, you have a turbidity maximum where the, the fresh water and the, and the salty water meet. Um, you have this two layer flow, which uh, creates stress.
And everybody asks that question. So uh, we can't change the astronomical relationships between the sun and the earth and the moon and so forth. That's these things. Um, and the reason I put this up here, and I'm not gonna go into this in very much detail, is that it turns out that in our system, most of the variability, a lot of the variability in the tides is declinational. In other words, it has to do with the angle of the moon relative to our equator. And it also has to do with the uh, tilt of the earth and so forth. That's the thing that we discovered. Uh, and because of that, we have a lot of other important uh, long-term uh, periodicities. This is the spring neap cycle. And it's merely when the, the sun and moon and earth are aligned, we get big tides. That's the conceptual model here on the far right. Uh, and then when the, when the moon and sun and, and earth are in quadrature, 90 degrees out, and we don't get big tides. But we have both of these, we have mixed tides. And the, the real discovery here was that we, we found these, a, a lot of the tides that are involved in our estuary creating these mixed tides uh, are, are uh, declinational. And why we didn't figure it out, I'm gonna go into that a little bit. So how do we manage the tides? The first thing we can do is manage, manage the transport process within these landscapes, which is reason why I wanna to talk to you a little bit about that. So you guys understand when I, when I, when I maybe put uh, some changes on the landscape, um, you'll understand why I did them and how they might work. The second thing you can do, and this is the big thing, because we have these loop low frequency uh, oscillations, um, we can synchronize, there's a possibility now that we can syn synchronize some of our management actions with those things. Um, imagine uh, a kid on a swing. This is the idea. And you're trying to, you're swinging the kid. You always wait till the kid gets up on top to push him because it doesn't take very much effort, right? If you try and push the kid at the bottom of the arc, he's going to kick your teeth out. That's kind of what we're doing with some of our management actions. But one of the things that we can do if there's natural things happening uh, in which a little bit is, for example, delta outflow could help, we can just give it a little bit and the odds of that working would be a lot higher than if you just dropped it in there and uh, didn't understand how the tides work. So that will be the focus of my talk. Um, and then when we're out in the, in the field, I'll talk more. Well, I'll focus on the transport processes, but then we'll talk about some of these big islands and some of the things that uh, they're not doing for us very very variably, and then talk about what we might do about it. So that's that. Set that. So the spring deep cycle thing, for those of us that work in the estuary, this is a big deal for the physics. It's a, it's a really big deal because um, it's going to change anything. So here we are. Um, this is what we have in San Francisco Bay. The top panel is the tidal currents. And the bottom panel is water level at the Golden Gate. We've got this amazing uh, water level record at the Golden Gate. Those folks did a fantastic job maintaining it for, uh, for forever. And uh, we're able to get some of these longer period mo mo motions and, and, and actually very accurately calculate these other motions. But the thing that we're coming to with uh, this re our revised conceptual model is that the really important thing is that we go from a very, very mixed tide or diurnal inequality which is in the reds, and then we go uh, to this more semi-diurnal tide. And, and, it, and you'll, if you look at a tide record, a long tide record, you'll see that this process is highly variable. And that's those other monthly seasonal uh, uh, signals in there. And, and uh, so this is, this is what we kind of focus on. So a lot, what we found is a lot of the action happens when the tides are mixed, semi-diurnal. That's, that's where the ecosystem action occurs. Um, and we were, we've always been, well, I'll talk about that. So how, how, did, how, how, did, how did this happen? I mean, we've been thinking the spring leaf cycle was the cat's meow for before I showed up. And uh, apparently, our, I'm just going to guess, our, our forefathers adopted East Coast estuaries. And if you, if you use just traditional tidal analysis methods and didn't do a certain thing, you would never really have, uh, really have found this. So... This is, this is a map of the tides, you can get it on the NOAA website. And uh, if you look at the, uh, the uh, east coast of uh, uh, the United States, um, semi diurnal tides and big time semi there. If you look at our coast, west coast, mixed tides. And so we, everybody knows it's there. In fact, when you read some of the initial documents, 
we have mixed tides, ebb dominated, and all these things. And people just threw those out without thinking about the consequences of what that meant for uh, transport and ecosystem. And so we just started cracking this open, as I said, about six months ago. I asked Peter if I could do this because we're sure of this, and you guys are going to be writing recommendations for the future. And we wanted to get you this on, on your radar because this is going to be a big shift in our thinking. So here's here's how we how we look at the tides traditionally. Um, we do we can do a four year transform, and this is actually on that uh, long Golden Gate record from 90, 1893 to 2023. So these are really accurate um, uh, analyses. And so these little these little uh, letters and numbers those are those are names of partial tides, and they're line spectra. You see they're really sharp. That's a log scale on the far side there. And we've got this big clump uh, around uh, the semi diurnal tides. The, the two means uh, it's a, roughly a semi diurnal tide, and then the, the ones mean it's roughly a, a diurnal tide. That's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is just you can do a harmonic analysis. This is what's done for tide tables. You go in to get a tide table. In fact, I think the NOAA website will just do this for you these days. Um, so you go out there and you see these spikes. It's very uh, very distinct frequencies, and that's the motions of the sun and the moon and rotation of the earth and so forth. So if you look at the two tides, on the left is uh, water level in San Francisco Bay. And uh, so you, you can look at the magnitude of these, this is really important. The magnitude of these are, is really important. And the interaction, I'm gonna talk a minute about the interaction between the magnitude of these, they're called partial tides, and again, they represent astronomical things that are going, going on. This is the way I like to look at it. So if you look at San Francisco Bay tides, and there's the data or the yeah, water level data on the top, and then you go down through these partial tides, the bigger ones are the more important ones. So we have M2, K1, O1, S2, and so forth. Those are the biggest ones. When you do a prediction on the NOAA website, it'll probably use, I don't know, 100 or something like that. They have, the longer the record, the more accurate they can do, and the more partial tides they can do. If you look at East Coast estuaries, you can look at the, the, the difference in the signal between uh, those, those uh, mixed tides and, uh, and the semi general tides is very apparent and very like kind of crazy in our system. It's very regular, not very much of it. And so this is, this, this estuary, uh, East Coast estuaries, the spring leap cycle is it. It's an approximation because this, the spring leap cycle is actually the inner, the definition is the interaction between M2 and S2. That's what it is. But that, there's a lot of other things going on in there. But if, if you say in, in an East Coast estuary that the spring leap cycle is, uh, is this, it's a pretty good model. Look at our system. We've got M2 is big, but K1 is pretty close. O1 is pretty close. We've got all of these partial ties that are pretty significant. And when they interact uh, constructively and destructively interfering, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, it's, it's crazy. And so um, we have a much more complicated system and it's certainly not a spring neat tide dominated system. So uh, how are we gonna design one? Yeah. But anyway, we, th this, uh, this is a big deal. So I do, I'm gonna talk about phase, I'm gonna talk about amplitude, I wanna make, I wanna talk about modulation. I wanna make sure we understand this because we're going to look at a much more complicated set of uh, interactions. So if you look at the top panel and the middle panel, look at the far uh, left panel, and you can see when the when the when they have very different frequencies, you get this stuff that we see in the in the band delta, where it's really a lot of high frequency wiggles and so forth. And that's just two, that's just two sinusoids, right? We got uh, we got probably a good 10 that matter. And then if you look at the sum of those. Uh, you get this green line. I hope you guys can see that. And that's the modulation. That's the modulation frequency and amplitude. And so what we're going to do now is look at these, these partial tides pairs and, and what the modulation amplitude is. So let me step back. Um, well, what we did is we did get, we did, we did it. We did a harmonic analysis. We, I don't know that anybody's ever done this, a harmonic analysis of the modulation periods. So we took all of those interactions and we looked at what the modulation periods were and we did, uh, in fact, I did this actually in I think 93. And what I saw was we have the spring leaf cycle here in black. You see that? Uh, 
it's a lot smaller than this other thing, which is the tropic equatorial cycle, and that has to do with the deflection of the moon. There's this other thing hiding in there. We we plotted it so we, or Paul Sutner, uh, my colleague, plotted it so we could emphasize it. There's this other thing that it in there that adds adds to uh, in in a, in a, in a, in a, um, a Fourier series, a Fourier transform. It adds to that. So if you do a Fourier series, it looks like it's twice as big as it, it really is because you conflate O one P one with spring leap. In any case, the, the the interesting thing about this is that. Um, we have these other cycles that show up. That's a seasonal cycle at 182 days. And then we got another one here. So we're starting to see um, a big difference here. So here we go with that, that modulation frequency or the synodic tree, which is the interaction between those various tides. And these are well-known, there's names for them, spring deep, perigene, and so forth and so on. If you look at our system, the tropic, uh, cycle is much larger than, of course, the, the one on the East Coast. <laughs> it's roughly the same size as the spring deep on the East Coast and so forth. So, and they're big, they're way bigger than you have on the East Coast. So um, we've got a very complicated mixed type six, uh, system. In fact, there's some metrics that you can use to evaluate how mixed a tide uh, is. We are right dead, dead in the middle between the semi diurnal and diurnal tides. So it is as mixed as you almost could possibly get. If someone wants to restart your computer. I think I'll say snooze, is that okay? <laughs> it doesn't like me saying so. Uh, yeah, I'll take a drink. The yellow line is getting close to the end. Oh, good. The yellow line's closed. Sorry. So, this is another thing that we do that I'm not sure uh, anybody has. I haven't seen anything in the literature. In fact, we're having a problem naming this. All these things are named, but uh, we're probably going to end up calling this, uh, you know, mixed semi narrow tide or something like that, is what we have, not the spring cycle, deep, deep cycle for sure. All right. What have you done? Okay, so we've got this really complicated time. What the heck are we going to do? You know, it takes, I don't know, 20 different partial types to add up to this crazy thing. So what we started doing was focusing on the envelopes. The blue line there, the outer envelope, the cyan line is, uh, is uh, uh, you know, the we, we focused on these envelopes and then took the differences to actually understand what was going on. And instead of having all this crazy stuff, we looked at, and one of the ones I'm going to show, there's there's like two or three metrics developed in this way that are useful for predicting certain things in the in the in the estuary. Okay, so I do want to go through what the spring leaf cycle uh, variability was all about uh, because we're not we're not going to be doing that anymore. One of the challenges with this is that when women, Bill and I, and a bunch of us were studying the entrapment zone X2. We were sampling between spring and neap sides, thinking there was a big difference in ecosystem response over that fortnightly period. It's not that. We were actually sampling at the wrong time. If we sample at a different time, and I'll describe that in a minute, um, we might got very different results. And that's true with our sampling programs. Uh, you know, everybody assumed there was this big difference in the in ecosystem and the tides between the spring and neap cycle. And, uh, I'll show you in a minute. That's not really true. So the one thing about the spring neap model is the fortnightly period, 14-day period thing was a big deal. Neap tides were supposed to be for gravitational circulation occurring. And then uh, the spring tides were this other thing I'll talk about in a minute, minute, which is a mixing on the horizontal plane, which can drive salinity intrusion, so can gravitational circulation. But these things were separated. This is a big deal. These things were separated by about seven days. We had a spring and uh, or uh, 14 days. We had a spring and then we had a neap and these, these phenomena were supposed to be relatively different. And that's not the way it is. We have multiple periods of low frequency variability. Those, they're, those are the periods that we have. We'll talk about the 18 year cycle, which is gonna be interesting um, when we get out on the boat, uh, but we do have mixed tides. And it's during these periods of mixed tides that all the things we thought were happening with the neap tides are happening. Uh, and then the semi diurnal tides, um, I have a, a lot more horizontal dispersion and so forth. So there we go. 
So this is the metric that we I'm going to talk about today because um, it does a very good job of predicting um, salinity stratification. And that's really important for um, production down in the low estuary. That's when we have stratification, we have the possibility of, uh, of blooms because the phytoplankton are uh, isolated in the upper part of the water column and they're not grazed on by clams. And so this is one of the things that we've been working on is like, when, when do we see blooms? And stratification and when it occurs is the important thing in our estuary for when it occurs. So we, what we, the metric we did was the weak flood ebb set. And why did we use that metric? It's because the tides are so strong in this system, it controls gravitational circulation. You try to get that two layer flowing, flow going, it stratifies and the tides say, no way. We're gonna just mix you up. And so you have to get a period of time where there's back to back relatively weak currents before you get gravitational circulation. And all the things other estuaries get all the time, but that we only get occasionally. There you go. There's that amplitude. And so if you look at when there's a, 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 a minimum in this low flood amplitude, and really it's just it's just the difference between a couple of these, uh, these um, envelopes, you can see that we get pretty good stratification events. And we've been running all over looking at historical data to make sure that this is a thing and it's pretty much a thing. There you go. So this is a weak ebb flood, but weak ebb flood set. Uh, there's the water level on the surface, spring deep cycle, granular quality. That was, anyway, um, that, this is the picture of that ebb flood amplitude over an entire year. And you can see that there's a pretty good correlation between those minimums in this ebb flood amplitude and uh, a pretty strong stratification. This is just one year. What we were doing actually out there with the state board is we had a bunch of bottom sensors and top sensors, and we were we were actually doing a detailed uh, survey of what was going on in Sassoon Bay and Confluence, and these are some data from that, I believe. But in any case, I remember as a young man asking Jim Clarn why we don't get blooms in the summer or the winter. He didn't know. This is why. If you look at the, the fall and spring, that's when we get these 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 uh, these uh, uh, minimums in this ebb flood amplitude. So I'm going to talk a lot more about this. But if you look at stratification, you look at this flood at amplitude. I'm not going to talk about. Uh, well, I can talk about it. There's another thing that goes on: is the daylight and stratification, or the don't they they change phase over the year. And so it doesn't do a phytoplankton any good when it's stratified and it's night. They don't photo, it does some good. Uh, they're not eaten by clams when it stratifies at night. But what we did is we looked at periods of time. We have another metric where we look at when uh, this, this ebb flood amplitude metric is a minimum and when that correlates with a time where it's sunny during the day. Or this happens where it's stratified during the day, sorry. So this is another thing, but if you get down to phytoplankton, um, you can see that there's a pretty good correlation uh, when we see stratification. And uh, again, we've been spending a whole lot of time looking at a lot of the historical data to see if, with this, with this metric, uh, to see if uh, we're seeing blooms that are correlating with this metric. And it's pretty good. I mean, it, it, it's a much higher probability, in fact, a lot higher probability when we have this weak flood amplitude uh, and we, we see stratification. All right. Obviously, I'm, we're still working on this. This is a pretty lousy plot, but I had it. All right. The other interesting thing about this particular model is that we have the we have we have a sequence uh, when the tides are weak: moderate flood, weak ebb, moderate flood, big ebb. And you can see that the big ebbs in the middle panel are on the top, and you can see that where the cyan and um, gentle lines kind of come together. That's this sequence. So what's interesting about this revised model of how things work uh, in this system is that uh, we have this period of vertical wheat mixing, gravitational circulation, phytoplankton bloom. It also happens to be <laughs> the time where we have a lot of horizontal uh, exchange. And if you look at the bottom plant, you can see that when we have these periods where this uh, we have mixed tides, that's when the salt comes up. And in fact, you can see those, see those little teeny blips uh, kind of around that magenta line. Didn't realize it, but uh, that is actually 
a flood that goes in a little ways, comes back a little bit, and then goes in a little ways. That process of it of two slacks and really weak circulation actually enhances mixing uh, when we have those tides. And so we call it, we have a lot of names for it, but the one I like is it's double pump flood. We have these, we have, we're F dominated system, which means we have a moderate flood. It comes back on a weak ebb and it goes up again. And that actually does a lot of mixing. And that's why when that's happening, you see these pretty big increases in salinity. The other thing, hang on, one more thing that happens at the same time. <laughs> this is a plot from uh, a, a, uh, a velocity or, or discharge sensor in a, in a slew up in uh, Rush Ranch. Uh, First Mallard Ranch is what it's called. And Chris Enright and I and Steve Culberson from those guys put this out. And we got this record for flow in, in this uh, little uh, tidal marsh, First Mallard Ranch. And I, I, don't, I don't remember... I remember seeing this big difference. And what this is, is um, those big changes in discharge uh, that happen roughly on monthly intervals. Um, that is when higher high water goes above the marsh plain. And so it inundates like crazy for about four or five days. I mean, that's double. When I first saw that record, I said, I've never even seen anything like that in the Delta because everything is uh, levied off. But in any case, um, what also happens during these diurnal inequalities uh, or this mixed type uh, is that we have marsh exchange. So all of those things are not separated in time anymore. They all happen at the same time, which is a, a completely different model. So um, I think I'm getting close to the end on this part of this talk. So we also then took this metric and did a power spectrum on it. And um, you can see these spikes at these very distinct periods, which involve, uh, when I did the harmonic analysis for the same thing, involves the, the, these uh, partial tides. But the thing that really shows up in this particular signal is this 18 year cycle. And what is a little, I'll, we'll talk about it tomorrow. This is a little more of a depth kind of conversation. So I just said all this that we have these double pump floods and all this sorts of stuff. Why is that sliding twice? Here's a picture of the double pump floods. This is what happens. I'm going to show some animations of this, I think, a little later, where you can see the, the a dye patch go in come back a little bit and go in. It has to do that because then we have this huge flood. So it, on the tidal time scale, it has to mass balance. Otherwise, water would go somewhere, right? So I uh, don't know why we didn't see this either. I've been looking at those dye patches moving around for a long time. But this, this double pump flood is a, is a big deal because there is a lot of mixing that happens when you have that weak ebb in between those moderate floods. So here we go. You're going to see it here. This is the dye patch that was done in the 90s. Goes and now... There she goes, okay? There's another one. I'm just gonna play these fast. They're cool and I can get a drink. <laughs> one of the things to notice is there's a lot of horizontal mixing, right? This, this place is, particularly Sassoon Bay with this rated channel system is very dispersive. Okay, I just talked about that. So here's the really cool thing about this particular uh, uh, thing that we're talking about is that <laughs> we can predict this. We can go back in time, which we've done, and we can go forecast. And so we can actually, if you look at that weak flood F set, we can go out when we think it's going to happen and sample uh, uh, and see what's going on, monitoring research. And then, of course, um, we'll talk about what we might be able to do with water project operations to try and get in sync with um, these 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 newly revealed uh, low frequency motions. So that's it. I, I really my hope is I can get through this whole thing and answer some questions. If not, you got me all day. Those that are coming on the tide. So anything that doesn't make sense that I've talked about too fast, um, let me know. What what time? How much time do I have? Actually, we're doing well. We got another twenty five minutes or so. Really? <laughs> I've never had the same. <laughs> I must be talking really fast. All right. So this the, the reason why we want to go through this, the reason I want to go through this with you, and I think other people should know this, is that uh, if we're going to modify landscapes, that's what we need to modify. We need to understand how these tidal transport processes work, not the net flow moving salinity out or the net flow moving critters to the pumps, not that. We need to understand how the tides work in these landscapes because that's 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 those are the 
those are the uh, transport mechanisms that actually, if we're going to do any modifying of, those are the those are the land, those are the, the things we need to do. So I have I've had this around forever in the uh, transport triad. We have this landscape thing, and then these are the three things that happen in um, in our estuary. You have horizontal dispersion. That's the transport part of it, based on the tidal currents. The net flows, which is rivers and exports, um, and then you have the horizontal salinity gradient. And together, those all, all of those things interact to control gravitational circulation. But as I said earlier, mostly the tidal currents do it. So here's your recipe. Um, you can modify, you can modify these two transport mechanisms, and then and then sync to, to uh, yeah, you modify. I got this wrong. Oh yeah, no, this is right. You modify these two things to get uh, to get uh, in synchrony up the, with the tides, and then um, I actually have that backwards. Anyway, um, this this uh, this triad actually is are the things that can, that have the only things that happen for transport with landscape. Uh, you know, modifying all of them, and so these this this actually, if I had it right, hard time seeing it. Um, this triad is actually indicates what you can can't do with these particular processes. So I always show this one here, which is um, uh, this is the net flow model of uh, how how the system works. Sacramento rivers come in, the, the net flows go down to the to the uh, pumps, uh, and then you have the San Joaquin, and then some some goes out to the, the delta. And this I want to characterize it. This this is this is the tidal system, and this part of my talk is all about making sure everybody understands how big the tides are in this system. It, so when we're starting to muck around with the tides and being in synchrony with the tides, we are starting to really uh, get into some uh, some heavy stuff. And we need to be very careful that we uh, don't get into unintended consequences. But I want to make sure that when you guys are talking about reservoir releases and uh, the Delta Cross Channel Gate operations, exports, um, when you get into most of the estuary, those are pretty, pretty weak. In fact, the tidal flows at Chips Island or 300,000, that would put the city of Sacramento underwater um, if we had a tidal flow like that in Sacramento River. So here it is. Um, I got this newly um, marked up. So if we look at the tides, that's the blue lines going up and down. Uh, and this is at Jersey Point on the San Joaquin where the little red dot is. And the red line right there, that's the combination of uh, reservoir releases or river flows, and, uh, and that's all river flows and exports. So a very we, we have a hard time measuring the effect of it, the, the, the discharge when we get down further into the system because what we're doing when we're measuring the net flow is we're subtracting those two big flows to get a very small flow. And uh, that, that's a very difficult problem. And so when we have really high flows, we can do a pretty good job of estimating that flows down in the system. But the further you move down in the system, the, the smaller the, the things that I think you're mostly talking about uh, become. And so when I start talking to you about getting in sync with the tides, that's something that it's a, it's a big thing. And, 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 and you know, kicking, kicking the tides uh, a little bit with delta outflow at the right time or changing the landscape can, can make a big difference because the tides in this system are so large. So here we go here. Let's see if I can get this to work man. Yes, no. And here we go. Yeah, so now you get around to me. Just click it again. Just click it again right now? Yeah. Okay. Didn't I know this was going to be a problem? It's really hard to see over here. All right. So um, this animation, those, those uh, light blue arrows are scaled to the tides. The little blue arrows are scaled to the tidal currents. And uh, you can kind of get a sense of how strong the tides are. During the drought, the tides were reversing almost all the way to the American River, certainly down below, you know, Mossdale. It reverses now. So it's a big deal. The thing that a lot of people don't recognize is that there's large discharges, but what matters for a lot of the things that I'm talking about are the currents. And the currents here are very strong because the tides are strong, much stronger than the Chesapeake, for example, and the depths are shallow, which means uh, we've got really high velocities, which is why we don't get gravitational circulation as much as we'd like. 
Oh, let's see if I can do it. Here we go. Hey, there. I think that's the last one of those. So what can happen is there's these things called the tidal excursion. You see how clumped they are, but once we get in, uh, and this is dispersion happening here, but uh, when we get out there, and this is one of the reasons why I showed this, um, these tides can move things, you know, eight, eight miles, you know, on a single tide. So things are moving rapidly, but they're also going a long distance. And this is, the, you can see the little, the blue guys uh, that are in uh, uh, an area that has a lot more bathymetric variability are distributed all over the place. There's that. So you saw those go back and forth. Challenging me here. Um, I will say that salmon do it too. Here we got um, some radio tag salmon going down, Georgian, uh, yeah, Georgian Slough, and they go back and forth. And so even though salmon can get out by swimming and so forth. Their, their, their motions are perturbation on this, a small perturbation. And in the net sense, they can, they can do things to get out quicker or go wherever they want, but they have got to be really smart about it because um, they are going back and forth with the tides. This will be an important, I, I'm gonna show you this. I think I got another thing here. Yes, okay. I wanted to show you that slide because I'm going to do some releases here uh, from the McCullough River. And I'm gonna show particles entering in Frank's track. This is some work that, um, well, I'm going to bring my mouth next to it. It's a bleaking angle. It's really hard to see. No. It's Sorry. It's going. Oh, it's gone. Good. So a bunch of particles released out of Jordiana uh, Slough. And uh, you'll see in a minute here. They go mostly <laughs> toward three miles blue. You saw the double pump flood there, right? So, um, very few particles went into Frank's track through Old River. That's the, 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 uh, the channel that's over there uh, going into Frank's track that's more vertical. Um, this is an interesting situation because, and I'll, I guess I'll talk about it when we get on, on the boat, but the thing is, is that the net flow, okay, I'll tell about it. The net flows are going from the McCullough down through Frank's track, Middle River. The net flows are going that way. But when uh, the salmon or whatever's in the water comes out of uh, the McCullough it's tightly locked with the flows in the San Joaquin because the San Joaquin is bigger, and they go, they get halfway to three miles slew every time they pop out. Can I ask you a quick question, John. What, yeah, time, what time of year is this? What's that? What time of year? Doesn't matter. Well, what season? Okay. It, it really doesn't. I mean, even though the, the flows in Georgiana could come up, the tides are so much stronger that it's going to look basically like this. And it, if you're wondering if that happens in the winter, it certainly happens in the winter. In fact, in fact probably more so because. There's more of a net flow usually going down that, that channel above Frank's track. There's usually more net flow because the, the water's going faster. So um, this is one of those things where, like, we had a problem with the conceptual model on how the, the tides work. This is one of those uh, things where if you don't understand how the tide work, you're, you're really going to think that um, the salmon come out, they get in the San Joaquin, and they, they have this net flow that's carrying them to the pumps, and that's not the way it works. You have to understand how the tide works to know where the salmons are, salmon are going because that's what they that's what they live with. The net flows are a small percentage of the tides. Okay. So I was hoping Sorry. no 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 this it's is just, good. it's just it's a basic question I just want to make sure I'm tracking the yep. estimate so I can fully receive right. the information. So the I saw I got the you get downstream and tides are the whole deal. And I got the graph with the different magnitudes relative Great. to inflows. I'm assuming, though, that the relationship between the tides and the stratification isn't like one to one with the magnitude. So I guess my question is, what is the like, like, do you have, is there a picture that you showed that I missed where it shows like, how the relationship between inflows and tides on stratification changes with difference at different graph. That's a very long conversation, but it is not linear. Uh, and it's another part of what we're working on. Um, there's all of, yeah, that's that's stratification dynamics and the, the environmental fluid mechanics that happens in estuaries are pretty complicated. It's a known thing. Um, and maybe we, 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 I have papers I can send you, but uh, in this system, uh, it, actually, I'll talk about it. So 
one of the, the uh, management actions we can do actually is release water, uh, more water during one of them. I'll, I'll talk about it in a lot more detail. Uh, release more discharge into Sassoon Bay. I don't think I have a picture of it. That compresses the salinity gradient. And then that can kick off gravitational circulation. So there is a there is a now known, well, that's always been known, but that's a, that's a mechanism that can happen. And on top of that, vertical mixing is trying to break it down. So it's 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 not an easy answer, but it's a very good question. It's one that people at Stanford and Berkeley and uh, all over the place have been working on. I should have one more quick relation. That was not a quick question. <laughs> What's that? Can you run it again? Sure. The second one is just um, in in thinking about, and I don't know what you're going to get here, but in thinking about these things that you can do to work with the tides, how, if, if the answer to the previous question is really complex, then how do you where does your confidence in what we can do in working with the tides come from in different places? And how is your relative confidence like as you move further downstream? I was not confident I could explain that to you, but I have a lot of confidence in the relationships we have to predict those things. Does that does that make sense? I mean, it, yeah. it's more it's more than I can do with the graphics I have now, and I'm, I'm certainly not going to show equations or anything like that. But uh, that is a, a seminal question for this estuary because we are on the knife edge of being able to get stratification at all, and so getting at the controlling factors uh, of, of of when it happens and knowing when it happens is a, a seminal question that we've been trying to answer for about thirty years, not probably longer than that. And I, I think. Because we now know better how the tides work, and we now we have always known the tides control stratification, we're getting a better idea of how it works. If that makes sense. Yeah. No. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And so. I, yeah. I, I guess I was just curious if you, within that range, are like. I think we should prioritize actions here where. The knobs that we can turn right. have a greater impact on stratification, and like our confidence level is greater. I'm very confident in the physical processes. What I should have said all along, when I'm talking about things we can do to Frank's tract or um, using delta outflow to compress the salinity gradient, those are all things that can be modeled. Because we've learned how this system works better, we have a better idea of how to look at the system with models. And I think if we can, we've got another beautiful data set in Sassoon Bay, which is a really hard place for a model to work. As I said, that the the, the uh, dynamic balance is very, very sensitive. And these models, we need to make sure that they can do that. Because uh, it turns out that there's a sub-model within these 3D models that's the turbulence closure scheme. Those aren't very good. And a lot of this depends on those sub-models in those models. So in any case, I would say that Almost everything I say today can be explored with models that would get through that confidence. Um, does, that, does that answer your question? So this is something that is relatively new and something that we need to work on. But in terms of the basic concepts, like the tides and the things I've talked about, we're very confident about that. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Actually, should we let John finish the presentation and yeah, we'll take questions after? Yeah. Okay, so here it is. Here's the interesting thing. We'll talk about this more. Most of these particles, and again, they're particles, but as I hopefully demonstrated, that most of what happens with these juvenile salmon, they, they, they can't go off to the side and hide. There's very little places for them to find velocity refugia. They can't do much. Uh, and, the, and in those channels, the water velocity is just going downstream hard everywhere. So there's very little swimming they can actually do, but most of the particles released went into False River. Right. They went around the horn and then they came in False River. They didn't go straight through through OSJ there. So uh, this is an example of um, you know understanding how the tides work and understanding how entrainment in the branch track of juvenile salmon works. Because I'm going to say this tomorrow, understanding how entrainment happens in branch track is probably the way of uh, trying to mitigate salvage and incidental uh, mortality and all of these things because. Frank's track, I did a lot of work, DWR funded me to do a lot of work on the drought barrier, and I got to look at all of our data, the, the data that the Bureau of Reclamation helped us collect. Uh, and um, Frank's track is not great for salmon. And it, it's, I think it's the critical path to 
um, getting getting those those uh, smolts and uh, into into the old Little River down below, and then and then in, into the pumps. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, Frank's track and dispersive mixing. This is a a bit of a, a, a this is my this is our classic uh, uh, animation on dispersive mixing. And by the way, when I show this. Um, I'm going to release dye up there in False River. Dispersive mixing and most and most of the horizontal plane transport mechanisms are all about taking a, a, a gradient, uh, 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 taking a, a higher concentration and moving it to lower concentration. You can't get dispersive mixing into Frank's track if, let's say, the salmon uh, populations are the same uh, outside of Frank's track and inside of Frank's track. But if there's a lot more salmon, delta smelt, salt anything outside of Frank's track on False River, this mechanism will move it into Frank's track. It just will, and it, and it does so um, remarkably well, which is one of the reasons why I think it's a really bad app there. So there it is. Comes in, chemical engineer, god dang it. A chemical engineer couldn't have built this place better for doing just what it's doing with that nozzle right there. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. So we're going to go up to Frank's track. One of the things I want you guys to get when you're out on the tour is this place is enormous. It makes its own weather in terms of the hydrodynamics in the system. There it is. So it comes through, these jets mix it up. It goes back, you're going to see the double pump flood, which has been there all along. It comes back. And what it does that's a double pump flood, is what goes in doesn't go out every single tidal cycle, okay? That is a very effective way of moving a higher concentration something into this place. So why does that happen? There is a difference in the way this works. It comes in as a jet and it mixes around. Of course, you guys all saw that. You can see a bunch of little velocity vectors there. It comes in like a jet. And then it goes back from all around. Okay, so there's this asymmetry in how things get shot into Frank's track. And then it takes all of that stuff that kind of billow along the sides and it brings it back, but it's mixing it the whole time. And so this is called tidal pumping and trapping. It's a really great name because this is exactly what's happening. And this is one of the reasons uh, why we should probably think about working on this place and trying to get rid of this mechanism. Because what the water project operators will tell you is once they get salt into Frank's track, it's very hard to get it out. In fact, if they don't have, if they get into Frank's track and they don't have reservoir releases to be able to get it out, um, it, it's, it's not a good day. Okay, I'm almost done. The other thing that I'm gonna talk about with regard to um, Frank's track and other places is something, uh, there's two other mechanisms that really move things, uh, that transport things from things, that salt, bugs, whatever, from one place to the other. One is, um, mixing along the edges, they, they call that shear flow dispersion. But the one people don't talk about, I wish I could use my mouse here. Yeah, I can just do it. The one pe people don't talk about is when there's shear like this, there's, there's uh, along the bank, um, the tidal excursion is much shorter because the velocity is slower. So let's say a particle goes like, like this along the bank, and then it's, it, 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 it's strip the slow along the bank, but then there's another parcel of water adjacent to it that goes a lot further away. It's called straining. Uh, it's not something that things, people talk about, but in our system with our really wide channels, tidal straining is really important because it, there's a, you can oftentimes see fronts out there along the bank where you have a, 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 a bunch of water that hasn't moved very far against water that's moved a long way. Now, if you have a gradient, salinity gradient, which we have, salty fresh, it takes salty water and moves it up, and, it, and fresh water remains next to the banks. When, when the tide turns and we get uh, slack water, it's not really slack water, it mixes around. And so one of the things we'll talk about with regard to making modifications to places is things we could do to minimize tidal straining, which is something that isn't talked about very much in fluid mechanics, but in our system in particular with like, uh, you know, the main part of the San Joaquin, Sacramento, and so forth. Uh, it's a big part of why salt moves up so efficiently from the from the ocean. And I think, did I actually finish on time with questions? <laughs> that, that's great. And we got a, if you, <laughs> are, you, are you good for? Oh, absolutely. 
question. So Jerry, I think you had a question. I'm fine. Okay. This is a lot, a lot of material. Um, I'm hoping that when we get on the ground out there in the uh, in the Delta, we'll be able to talk about these things in place and uh, a lot of this stuff will make more sense. <laughs> and uh, Laura, and then Jay, and then Dave. Um, we spoke on the phone a couple of weeks ago. I thought, and I might have just heard you, but I thought that you mentioned that there was some type of physical barrier that had either been built or was a plan yep. to be built on the west side of Frank's tracks. Yep. Um, can you just tell us, describe that so yep. that and what it was trying to do and whether it succeeded? Yes, and I was, I, what I do when I go on these tours is I have these boards and uh, it's got all these pictures and stuff like that. What they, what we do in a drought is one of those things. And I will talk about it in more detail, but what they do, and this is why it was funny to look at Frank's track uh, in this whole area is they, they actually put a physical barrier. If you go on the tour, you'll see it tomorrow across this channel. Uh, it's it's that's that's false river, right? It's false river. Okay. And they put that in because we don't have the water to physically keep salt out anymore, or we may not have the water to keep salt physically out. And so uh, in many cases, they put it in early because uh, it, the last time it was put in, we got lucky. We got a big a couple atmospheric rivers and we were we were got the all clean, but we were we were all ready to say okay. The next thing they do, they put a, a barrier physically in there because of this mechanism. This is if if you if the water project operators let it go into 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 uh, the San Joaquin a little ways, uh, they, they will they will be freaking out because it's very hard to get it out. So and then, again. If, if a delta smelt a bunch of delta smelt are going up there, they're going in too. It's the same mechanism or sand, fumal sand. So they'll put a barrier there, and I'll tell you tell you about it tomorrow. They'll put barriers other places as the drought gets worse. But did that help to prevent salmonids from coming back into Frank's track? That was the story I was going to tell. Oh. The story was that they probably by they ended up notching the barrier to go to the next year, uh, the next salmon cycle, and. Uh, probably didn't help salmon survival very much. Because what I just showed you is most of the salmon came in through False River. So again, this, this, is, this, this is all conjecture because one of the things I was gonna recommend on the, on the boat, and I'll recommend it now, and I've recommended to Josh several times over a beer, is we really need to understand what Frank's track is doing for those things. Uh, and we understand what it's doing for salt because we can, we can model it very well. It's a conservative tracer. It's really easy to model. But we don't understand as well what happens when juvenile salmon come down uh, from the north down through the Georgiana Slough and how they get into Frank's track, when they get into Frank's track, and those sort of things. Because it is a hop, skip, and a jump to the pumps once you get into Frank's track. And we need to understand how the net flows, uh, the, the actual net flows, because one of the places we first see the effect of pumping from the the, the uh, west and north is in those two channels, Old River there and Frank's track there. That's where we first started to see a real effect of pumping. And so it's one of those things that, uh, again, it's, it's one of my recommendations is that uh, we, we should really try and figure out uh, what we what we can do with Frank's track, but also uh, perhaps and Josh would be the one to fund it, uh, Josh and the Bureau, perhaps do a little more work on understanding Frank's track's role in the entrainment into the South Delta. Okay, so J Jay and then Dave, and that'll be the last two questions. Oh, uh, and then we'll go to Albert too. So in terms of management actions and implications, putting in a barrier at West Falls River, both for salinity control and for keeping the juvenile salmon, keeping more juvenile salmon out of the central delta, seems like promising idea. That that wouldn't be my idea no. because because. One of the problems you get into with, uh, and I, I don't have the graphics there, is that when you put that barrier in, then the tide goes around the horn, the velocities get stronger, and so the dispersive mixing is more. Eventually, here's the problem. Eventually, you have the same problem with Old River, but oh. it gets really, it gets really bad. So one of the things you, you might be able to modify Frank's track in some way to where it would increase the resilience to a worse drought than we had, not simply uh, putting a barrier in there. So for, so for a drought, it makes sense to have that barrier. Yeah. But, we, but in general, it, no. Yeah, I, I think there's a, there's a way to have our cake and eat it too. We'll, we'll talk about that. Um, 
What about operations of Montezuma Slough and, and places where you have operable gates or might think about putting an operable gate? I think what I'll talk about uh, on the boat uh, with regard to compressing the salinity gradient and doing things as a soon bed, I think Montezuma Slough is a wonderful tool to experiment with. But not just for habitat within Sisu Marsh, but for the, the, the you know, the estuarine turbidity maximum and all of those things. Right. In Sisu Bay. I guess as a loop of work as well, to operate the cross channel, cross -channel gates, because it's too far up. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, no doubt. <laughs> I, I, I just, no, it, it, no, it doesn't, it doesn't scale for sure. Right. Yeah, uh, and we did try operating it tidally, but it was for day-night operations to protect salmon, but, um, you'd have a hard time feeling with the gate operations on that anyway. Well, I, I know because I've done experiments where they they shut it down <laughs> or tried to do experiments and they shut it down. It's very difficult because you know how many people depend on that water. Yeah. yeah. Right. Sure. yeah right. So, Elvit, last question. Yeah, thanks for this fascinating talk. I loved it. Um, I think you illustrated very well how the um, so how the types could inform habitat design, but also like the timing of operations. And I was thinking, what about monitoring? You know, we have all these long-term monitoring programs, like the uh, uh, for you know, the troll, the study, and so on, and so on. And like seeing how you know how types drive everything. Is this data completed by the types? As far as I know, like they go out in once a month or twice a month, and but that it's not relevant to the types, right? Yeah. The, the, the real problem uh, with uh, sampling when you have, can only sample, say, once a month is that you have, you not only have the 12 and 24 hour stuff, which is the actual ties, now you have a couple other motions. And so it's very difficult to capture the estuary in a consistent way so you could detect um, an operation. Now, if you did the salinity control gates or something like that, then you're out for a very short period of time. You can do 30 hour studies to see what the difference is. Uh, we've done many of those in the past. Those are very expensive. I, I don't know that we would do those anymore. We, we certainly did them a lot. We have every boat practically that the, the big boats that existed in the system doing those entrapment zone studies, those studies that when Kimmer and Bill Bennett and others did. So um, I think you'd have to be very careful. I don't know if you know about the term aliasing, but when you have a lot of different uh, scales of variability, uh, oftentimes you have to sample faster to get at the answer than you have the ability to sample because it's just too expensive. Many of the flow ecology relationships uh, are using you know, many years of data wherever the data happens to be collected, right? So maybe you look completely by what you are showing. Yeah, I, I, I still think it's not frequent enough. I'm, I'm, we're very fortunate. We're in the digital world. We can get data seconds or mostly 15 minutes, but the Holy Grail would be able to get this distribution, zooplankton distribution at a, at, a, at a faster time scale. And then we, then when we start fiddling with gates and doing these other things, we can use all the tools and more that I showed today. Great. Well, thanks. I think we'll draw this to a close. And just a couple of commentary. We had asked John to talk about the latest findings. And so, John, a lot of the, what you were talking about today is a work in progress. We understand that. Yep. It's totally data-driven, uh, but just to give you a little qualifier there. For sure, thank the, you. The other thing that I would also say is for those of you, in, when you're looking at those simulations and you look at the model grid, the monitoring that John's put together on the modeling, we've had to reduce the size of the grid over the last couple of decades down to a, a very, very small grid in order to get the complex hydrodynamics right. And it's so important when you look at the particle tracking at, at each of those junctions. And so I just wanted to highlight that. And when we're out in the field tomorrow, I think it's you'll just see the scale and the enormity and the thought that the USGS reclamation and others have put into in the monitoring program so that, you, you, that the data is representative and can be included in the models correctly. Yep, yep. I, uh, when I was in grad school, I was a modeler and uh, I was trying to do Sassoon Bay and there's no way. <laughs> One of the reasons, and I know this because I started collecting data, partly because the models weren't working very well, and you could talk to any of the modelers, we have a great data set. So, and they're, 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 uh, they should, and they do do validation and calibration of these models on the prototype 
or questions that they're answering. And they have to do that. Otherwise, we don't know for sure whether it's working. And so many of the ideas I've talked about, I know the models are going to work well at. In fact, a lot of the ideas are going to be fail fast. If you put it in there, it's going to be pretty cheap. It's either going to work or it's not. So um, you're right. Um, this modeling network has allowed our models to even be a lot better. Yeah. Yeah. So with that, uh, let's thank John for his time. And we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Right. So it's going to be nice, even though it's supposed to be 90 later than we're going to be on the water. And you should bring sweater or something like that, layers. And if you're into coffee, I would go light. There's not a lot of places to go to the bathroom. That's my last shot. <laughs> thank you for having me. OK, well, thanks, John. And perhaps we'll yeah. convene as the committee in about uh, uh, five minutes. So give folks a chance just to stretch legs and be back in about eight minutes. Yeah. No, I'm good to meet you. You know, it's, it's scary to present that. Like, um, oh, well, the, well, can I ask you the question I was going to ask?